Well, that was a glimpse of the shocking and heartbreaking new documentary by the British director and producer Leslie Udwin, who in her time has won 35 prestigious awards for her past work, including a BAFTA for her film East is East. The Modi regime in India uh, has been so disconcerted by India's daughter's harsh truths and the controversy that has surrounded uh, the film's uh, imminent release uh, have banned it and uh, it's now only being able to be seen in Samizdat uh, situations online. To discuss this and more, we're joined by Barker Dutt, uh, India's foremost on-air journalist. He's winner of over 40 national and international awards. Her Sunday talk show on NTTV, We the People, has won the Indian Television Academy Award for Best Talk Show five years in a row. Think of her as a cross ready between Christian Amanpour, Diane Sawyer, with a dash of Oprah. Okay. <laughs> uh, Thank you. She's now about to launch her own media production company in a think tank. So please welcome Leslie and Barker. Thank you. So Leslie, it was obviously a huge coup to get into the Tihar jail, the most kind of fortified, uh, you know, incarceration center in Delhi, and get on camera the driver of the bus that night, Mukesh, who we saw on the screen. Um, in the film, you know, he seems completely without affect. He seems a kind of a, there's a deadness to him that's, you keep wanting to crack. What did you learn from that interview? What, how did he come across to you after the many, many hours you spent with him? I spent 16 hours with him over three days. First, let me say, it wasn't that difficult to get into Tihar. I was compelled to do it because I believe that without actually understanding these rapists, mm -hmm. these men who commit such heinous offenses against women the world over, how can you change them if you can't understand them? So I wrote this absolutely impassioned letter. Um, and I hope, I believe, it was that that did it. So actually, it wasn't that difficult, and I would encourage all of you to do the same in prisons across the US, because God knows the record in the US is abysmal. You know, 97% of rapists in the US have not spent a single day in prison. Um, and it's really, really important for me to say that this, this film, which was always designed to unleash a campaign has global imperatives and global objectives. And we must be very, very um, keenly aware that we, all of us, the world over, the UK where I come from, every country in the globe, Sweden where I was yesterday, we all must hang our heads in shame until we correct this imbalance. And now, back to your well, question. Okay. Well, yes, the, qu the question was... I know. How did <laughs> <laughs> That's the longest introduction right. anyone's ever going to give. <laughs> but here's the thing. Um, what did I learn? I went in with a set of expectations that were driven by the media reports which told me that these rapists were monsters. You've seen yourself, that gruesome detail of the intestines, and I saw you all turn away with horror, as any civilized human being would, that the intestines were pulled out with bare hands. So what did I expect? I expected psychopaths. I expected aberrance of nature. And here is the terrifying, chilling truth. They are not monsters. These are ordinary human beings. They are very unremarkable. They are apparently normal. And I interviewed two psychiatrists who have dealt with them over a very long time. And the psychiatrists say the same thing. These are normal human beings with antisocial tendencies. What are these antisocial tendencies? They are the learned attitudes to women, which society programs them with. So these offenses against women are just a part of the story. The story begins when a girl is born and is not welcome, and then is not nourished as much as her brother, and then is destined to go as some domestic slave to her husband's home. So the disease is not these men 
The disease is gender inequality. It's as simple as that. That is what I learned. And that is far more chilling. Barker, how does that sound to you? Obviously, you know, you're hearing this about the uh, rapist. There was obviously, there were six men, actually. There was one mm. who was a juvenile, one who committed suicide. There are three on death row and the bus driver. The bus mm. driver is the one that we're hearing from in the film. Is that your same take on these men? Or should we also be looking at this in the context of the intense poverty from which they came? I don't think I would look for cultural or economic contexts to locate a rapist within. The poverty may explain how somebody shapes up in some cases, but if you look at the statistic that more than 90% of women in India know the men who sexually abuse them, I actually think that this is a mythology to look for monsters. These monsters are within our homes. These monsters are within our marriages. These monsters are within something called marital rape that is still to be recognized by Indian law. I actually have a problem with locating Mukesh within his acute poverty, which we do see in Leslie's movie, because I think that class has nothing to do with Correct. it. And actually, socioeconomic indices in India show that more educated and richer people have a higher rate of female feticide in their homes than poorer families. So that's one thing on the class. But I do have to say, much as I admire Leslie's advocacy for the cause of gender, that I'm a bit, I'm a bit disturbed by this generalization of, of Indian women as somehow subservient, somehow willing to be supplicants, somehow defined only by the men in our lives. I can tell you that, and Leslie, you've met enough of us to know, that it, this, is, this may cause your stomach to churn right now, but I want all of you to understand that the noise around rape in India is a moment of hope. The reason you're hearing this noise is because we are speaking, and thousands of women are speaking with us. Le Leslie, your film is obviously very controversial, and many of the people who've spoken out have not been fans of the film. What do you think is at the bottom of that? I think, like many countries on Earth, national pride comes into the decision. I think it's a misplaced notion, and I think it has boomeranged and backfired in the most well, I won't even say embarrassing way, because it's tragic. It breaks my heart that there should now be fingers pointed against India, which is the world's largest democracy, and it is a democracy, but it is a very undemocratic act to ban a film, to put your energy and focus on hiding a sense of shame that you fear might adhere to your nation, rather than joining in this global movement to save the world's women. Um, and if I may just come back, Barka, mm. on, on what you said, 100% mm. there is great hope. And yes. that's what took me there. It wasn't the rape that took me to India. Mm. It was the protests. Mm. It was the fact that actually, India was leading the world by example. Can any of you remember in your lifetimes, I certainly can't in mine, and I've lived longer than probably most of you, um, a country that has gone out with such commitment, such passion, in such a sustained way, not for a day, not for two days, for over a month, unprecedented numbers. Yeah. And they are the heroes, and they are Indians. They are ordinary men and women of India. Well, many of them young men, too, which was the most encouraging part of it. Absolutely. There yeah. is a huge swathe of forward-thinking, extraordinary men and women in India who are demanding change. And it's for them I went out. And that is why I'm so heartbroken that what I actually set out mm. to have India put on a pedestal to say, let us lead the world by example. And, you know, Prime Minister Modi, who has made the most welcome, the most eloquent and admirable statement since he came into power. He has a campaign called Betty Bachao, Betty Parao, which means save the girl, educate the girl. 
This film actually holds a mirror to Prime Minister Modi's professed and meant. But, Mbaka, how much do you think the reaction has been because Leslie is, in fact, not Indian and has made this film? Was this, was, this was nationalism, you think, triumphing over a sense of uh, self-criticism? I, I should say that a lot of us are very uncomfortable with the ban on Leslie's movie because we are against all bans. Uh, that does not mean that we and Leslie would be the first one to understand this as a filmmaker, that does not mean we cannot critique the film. Of course not. That does not mean we cannot try and explain to all of you here who think of my country as an intolerant, dictatorial regime instead of the argumentative Indians that we are. Um, let me explain. Let me try and wear the hat of those who are uncomfortable with Leslie's mm -hmm. film so that some of you have a more complex understanding of the country I come from. One was there a need to interview a rapist? Was that amplifying his voice? Do we really need to hear him talk about how the intestines of a young woman were pulled out? This is a question that many feminists I know, Leslie, and maybe you can speak to it, have raised. Two, did it matter that you were from another country? I would say we should honestly say yes. Does that make us foolishly defensive? Not, yes. ne not necessarily, <laughs> not necessarily. And let me, put, let me throw this question back. You spoke about how abysmal the state of prisons are and, and, and rape convictions are in the United States of America. The fact of the matter is that rape is much, more, much higher in the United States and the United Kingdom than it is in India, the rate of rape. Conviction rates are higher, conviction rates are higher. Let me complete my point, let me complete my point. Conviction rates are higher in India than they are in the two countries I named. Does that mean we should not come out on the street and hold a mirror to ourselves and call out sexual violence where we see it? Yes. I am only trying to explain the discomfort that people feel at the asymmetry of power. They ask whether an Indian journalist like myself could go to Ferguson and make the definitive film about race in the United States of America and whether you would be accepting of it. Does this mean I support the ban? Absolutely not. I am only trying to explain the discomfort that some have felt so you can address it. First, let me say, the statistic game is a joke and really must be stopped. I mean, you cannot begin to talk about statistics in India where shame adheres to a rape victim. Mm. Rape is not reported for the most part. There are no statistics that bear scrutiny, that can stand up <laughs> to rational debate. And anyway, the whole notion of our country rapes less than your country is ridiculous. No, 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 no. <laughs> of course it is. Of yeah. course it is. Of course it is. And I would be the first one to say so. And as you know, the network I'm with has spoken strongly in Absolutely. favor and they are of this film and against the ban. NDTV so are it's... heroes of journalism. But, Leslie, we do need we do need to pause and ask whether the India you went out to celebrate is today being seen as too unsafe for women to travel to. And that is disturbing to me, who lives as a free woman in a country I'm proud of. Well, well let's well. just ask ourselves before you two... Uh, <laughs> no, no, we love each other. You know, one, one criticism that I, that I have heard, uh, and let's see what you think about this, Barker, is that the outcry about Nabaya, about Jyoti, would not have been it would not have been such a tinderbox rape case mm. if this young woman had not been an aspirational young mm. woman. Because the thing Agreed. about Jyoti was yes. she was a young woman who was trying to get out of her poverty, who was trying to be a medical student, whose father was an enlightened father. She was the absolutely archetypal, aspirational, new, modern Indian girl, mm. trying to put mm. all of that behind her and entering the new world that is, mm. could be the mm. future of India. Do you think that uh, there is something to be said for that, 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 that girls, you know, like girls in the untouchable class are raped all the time, and nobody mm. cares. Mm. Is it just because she was aspirational that this outcry happened? I think there is an element of truth to that, but I think it's also because her story represented hope. And I think to that extent, Leslie's absolutely right, that she set out to tell the story of A, a young girl who dared to dream, she also came from a very modest family. Her parents had to sell land, the little piece of land that they owned to educate her. She dreamt of being a doctor. Her story was one of not just economic aspiration, but of a young woman dreaming beyond her boundaries. Her story was one of 
women her age wanting to be bigger than themselves and bigger than the families they'd been born into. But it was also an inflection point in the gender debate because it is the first time in my 20 years of journalism that I have seen gender finally mainstreamed as an electoral and political issue. And to that extent, I completely think that what Leslie went out to capture is so important to tell the world that we were marching on the streets Correct. to save our women. Yes. And for the first time, Gender was not this airy fairy issue that featured reporters in newspapers and televisions and only women reported on. There were men marching with women and we are seeing our politicians today being made accountable for their record on gender and that is why this story and yeah, Leslie's it, it, film is so important. It was a kind of uh, Arab Spring of gender, really. It wasn't was. It, 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 was. it was. was. But given how badly the Arab Spring kind well, of turned out, I was about to say, well, that's that, maybe that's that not the best analogy. So well. We know that that didn't turn out so well. I'd just like to now just go to another uh, clip from Leslie's film because. Shocking though some of the statements were by the rapist, for instance, when he said it was her fault for being out on mm. the streets. You know, mm. what could she expect? She was. Uh, if she wanted to go out after nine and roam around, as he put it, uh, what could she expect except for something bad Tina, to happen? politicians say exactly the well, same we're thing. we're about to see something like that now. Yes, what absolutely. shocked me more, frankly, were some of the statements of one of the lawyers that you see yeah. in the mm. film. So let's just roll that clip and see the lawyer of... She should not be put the on the street just like food. The lady, on the other hand, we can say the girl or woman are more precious than a gem than a diamond. It is up to you how you want to keep that diamond in your hand. If you put your diamond on the street, certainly the dog will take it out. You can't stop. So this was a man who is not uh, coming from a slum and who is not an ill-educated man. He's a man sitting in a room full of books. He's an educated lawyer. How often did you come across that attitude? Well, the, you know, I interviewed him first. Um, and, and was so shocked by what he said mm. that I asked for another three hours with him. So I did six hours <laughs> in all with him. Um, almost couldn't believe, you know, quite how um, extraordinarily misogynist mm. this man was. And, and then I thought, well, this, this must be just the lone barking of a rabid dog, right? Yeah. But oh no, I interviewed the other defense lawyer. <laughs> also a so-called educated man, and what he said to, to the media, so I used this, yeah. uh, this clip of archive in the film, um, it was on the day of the sentencing when his clients had been sentenced to death, and he said, if my daughter disgraced herself, I would take her to my farmhouse, and, her and in front of my whole family, I would pour petrol on her and burn her alive. It was pretty shocking. I, and I... months later, when I interviewed him, thinking, well, you know, he'll explain he didn't really mean petrol and he didn't mm. really mean burn. <laughs> he said, I stand by mm. that remark. I meant exactly what I said. Okay, so, Barker, mm. what do you say to that? I think these men are worse than the rapists. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, there's, there's nothing to be said about them except to say that they bust the myth that you have to be poor and uneducated and Correct. illiterate to be yeah. a rapist. Correct. <laughs> right. So patriarchy trumps poverty is what you're Absolutely. saying. Absolutely. Yeah. So Can I just mention one thing? Friday two... Sorry, I talk yeah. so much. No, no, Please do, forgive me. Go. I'm so full of this. this um, two, we two weeks ago, on a Friday night in London, I showed the film at Dougherty Street Chambers, which is uh, a chambers of Jeffrey human Robinson, rights lawyers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the chairman of the UK Bar Association was there, and I got him to pledge that the UK Bar Association is going to discipline and call for the dismissal of all judges and uh, QCs and lawyers in the UK who say very similar things. Um, and he is going to join hands with the Bar Association That's of good. India and the International Bar Association to discipline and dismiss such lawyers. I just wanted to, that's, that's, that's right. absolutely fantastic. And uh, a lot of us have signed a petition to actually ask for these men to be disbarred as lawyers. So that movement is underway as right. well. Uh, but it's, it's significant what one of them said about, uh, uh, Tina, what one of them said about she asked for it. Uh, there is another, rape victim, who many of you have not heard of because she did not become a global story like Nirbhaya did, 
called Suzette Jordan. Mm. Suzette Jordan was raped in the city of Calcutta, and she died this past week. And the reason I want to talk about her is just to say that she was not your quintessential victim. When she was raped, there was this suggestion that she'd been out partying. There were even insinuations that she'd been a sex worker, so in some ways she'd asked for it. After her rape, she continued to live the larger than life, flamboyant life that she'd always lived. She refused to be a victim. And one of the things that disturbs me as a woman, and I don't know if all of you have felt this as well, is that when we rally for rape survivors or rape victims, we want to foist our own narrative of victimhood on them. We want them to conform to our impressions of women as victims. And that is why, while we talk about Nirbhaya today and India's daughters, there is this woman, Suzette Jordan, who's also India's daughter, who said, I'm a single woman, I will go out and have an affair with a man if I want to. I will go out and have a drink if I want to. I will smoke that cigarette if I want to. I will go and march in the slut walk as a statement of protest and embracing my sexuality if I want to. So it is so important to not confirm the rape survivor or the woman who's died in this case from rape as a victim. I just hate that word, victim. So do we I absolutely agree with that one. I don't come across as a victim, do I? <laughs> I don't think so. I have been raped. I'm one of five, globally, yeah. women who are raped. 20% yeah. of us across this world are raped. Well, I mean, um, that's something for us to think about. <laughs> I'm sure that many people in this room have stories that they have, mm. haven't shared. Yeah. Um, Barker, a lot of, there was a lot of talk at the time of the rape that some of this was about feral young men detached from the city, mm. coming in from the country, really shocked, in a sense, deeply by their own traditional values, being encountering for the first time women and girls in short skirts, girls not you know, conforming to the traditional way. How much of that do you think is playing into what seems to be such an, a great deal of sexual violence in the cities? And how much is it, do you think, uh, is, there a, is there a role that Bollywood is playing in excessively titillating content? Mm. Two separate questions there, Tina. Um, do I believe that the churn in India, the globalization that we are now part of as the economic boom happens, has upset the sort of balances of society as we know it? Yes. Do I believe that's the defining characteristic to understand sexual violence? Absolutely not. A 70-year-old nun was just raped this week. A 70-year-old nun. She wasn't out wearing a short skirt or smoking a cigarette, and even if she was, so bloody what? But the point is, <laughs> the, the, the point is, it's one sliver of the story, the globalization, the churn. In my experience, almost every woman I know has experienced some form of sexual abuse. And most of it is actually what I call the enemy within. Most of it is somebody we know. It's an uncle, it's a cousin, sometimes it's a father. And I would not overstate the class and poverty argument when it comes to understanding sexual violence. On Bollywood, and I think since we are women in Hollywood, this is something very interesting. This is an intense raging debate back home. Frida is here, she would know about this. One of our veteran stars, Shabana Azmi, made the argument after this gang rape that cinema was playing its role in hypersexualizing women, and this was not emancipation. This was not liberation. We, we now have something called the item number in our movies, and the item number is essentially a woman who comes on and does this song and dance number, and she's wearing effectively very little clothes, and she's supposed to be this sex bomb kind of figure. Item number, it's called. Uh, but women of my generation, younger than Shabana, have argued that women are free to define their own sexuality, and if they want to do an item number, so be it. If they want to embrace hypersexualization, so be it. If they want to critique it, so be it. It's all about choice. I personally believe that cinema, like mass media everywhere, is making it impossible for real women, for women like us, to conform to the role models that are presented before us, because we either have to be that sexy number or we have to be that puritanical sort of asexual person, and we're firmly in the middle, and I am disturbed by the oversimplistic projections of women in our cinema. And Bollywood's run by men. I mean, it's yes. men who dictate yeah. how women should look. I think it's pornography. Yeah. Well, 
that's another whole debate. Um, let us just turn for one minute um, uh, to what has happened since this mm. rape. Uh, what is really going on now? I mean, is there, is Modi, as you said, has made statements about educate a girl, teach a daughter, all of these things he's saying. Is there anything real going on in terms of changes of law, in terms of uh, women reporting rape more, Barker? What are you seeing uh, post this rape? This is, not, is this going to be a slip back in the same way the Arab mm. Spring has, or is this really about now going forward? I think the very fact that when Leslie's movie was stopped from release in, in, in India, the fact that it became a national conversation shows how much we care about this, how much we want to join that conversation about gender. I do not know a single person who supports this ban. I do not know a single person. Well, and Barka, I saw the Lok Sabha uh, live the day after the ban. Yes, there's a politicization. There were two, two MPs. Javed Akhtar and Anuaga, yes. And Anuaga, who yes. spoke against the ban and every other one was just spouting But see what hysterical. happened since then. Since then, Leslie, everybody's seen the movie. Everybody has seen the movie. It, 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 that's one of the great triumphs. I mean, it's even been projected onto a sheet in a village. Yes. I, yeah. Yeah. It, it's yeah. it's yeah. quite amazing how this film has and, gone. And, and, and I think that the anger among just people who may love your film or hate your film, but the anger that they were stopped from seeing it is an indication of the fact that something is changing in India. It started changing on December 16th, two years ago, and it continues to change. And one thing I'm very grateful to Leslie for is that we are back with gender as a national conversation. Yes. If it was in danger of fading from the national headlines, it's firmly back in place. How much has substantively changed in terms of our institutions being free of misogyny? We have a long way to go, Tina. I'm not going to sit here and present some rosy picture of India as having arrived on the stage when it comes to gender equality. But I can tell you that this generation of Indians, and, this, I, I, and I include young boys and men in it, and this is so important, they are wanting to center stage the gender conversation like never before. And the fact that the Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, in his first speech after getting elected as Prime Minister on our Independence Day, spoke about toilets for girls. It may sound bizarre here in Los Angeles, <laughs> but it's, you know, women have to defecate in the open. Young girls don't have loos. They don't have bathrooms. The fact that the Prime Minister got up and spoke about this as a centerpiece... It was heroic, actually. Was, what was, ...was something that even his worst critics have applauded him for. So we're a work in progress. We have a long way to go, but something has shifted. Yeah, thank you. Leslie. <laughs> Last word to Leslie. Leslie, what do you want to accomplish by this, of this film, and what's next for you with this film? Is it going to be seen I here in America? I want to go um, on a tour of every country in this world. <laughs> I want to go with somebody like Jimmy Carter. I haven't discussed it with him yet. <laughs> <laughs> somebody like Jimmy Carter. I mean, Jimmy somebody Carter, playing Jimmy Carter. God mm. bless him, has done more for no, this Jim, world than many Jimmy people. Jimmy Carter came on the stage in Women in the World last year, and he started talking about toilets in India. And yeah. I just thought, yes. bless him. Yeah. Absolutely bless him. Yeah. He's, what, 80-something. Bless yeah. him. He has said he wants to dedicate the rest of his life to gender equality. So I want Jimmy to come with me to every country in the world and speak to the education authorities, obviously the heads of state, if they will, you know, listen. But this is a worldwide problem. Yeah. And it's mindset. That is the problem, and the only solution is gender equality. And however long it takes, you know, we should all be out there the first Sunday of every month marching in front of our parliaments in every country in this world, demanding respect, autonomy, and safety for women. The time has come. Yeah. Enough thank is you. enough. Well, thank you very much, Leslie and Barker. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we should have a... I think we should do a rematch between you two in front of the cameras. <laughs> it was wonderful. I could listen to you all night. You're absolutely marvellous. So thank you very thank much, you. everyone, and we will... Thank on you. ...on with the show.